Good morning and welcome to everyone on this beautiful Sunday morning. So thankful that we can gather and worship once again to praise our Heavenly Father. We pray that our worship today may be pleasing in His eyes and beneficial also to us as His people. We welcome all those also tuning in via live stream. We pray that today too may be a blessing for you. The Council has the following announcements. An attestation has been requested by Dave and Michelle Vanessen, along with their three baptized children, to the Living Waters United Reformed Church in Brantford, and we pray that the Lord will bless you as you take up your place in that congregation. A coffee social is scheduled to be held after this morning worship service. Everyone is welcome and encouraged to join us. And today's host family is Ed and Henrietta Vanderland. If you would like to visit with them, you can meet them after the morning service, the main entrance to the auditorium. This morning, the collection is in the pew for the work of the deacons and at the door for helping hands. This morning, we welcome Reverend Darren Feenstra to the pulpit as he proclaims the good news to us. And we pray the Lord may bless you. And then also, sorry, uh, the guests at the Lord's Supper table this morning are Marion Vanderhout from the Bethel Canadian Reformed Church, Anthony and Julie Grunwald from the Rockingham Free Reformed Church in Western Australia, Stuart Harsford from the Carmen East Canadian Reformed Church, and Nicole Gelms from the Grassy Canadian Reformed Church. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a privilege that we can be here again uh, together as God's people and worshiping him that we're called into his presence too. Let's then uh, stand and declare our dependence on God. Dear congregation, where does our help come from? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive then God's greeting to you this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our first song this uh, morning is Hymn 32. It's a resur resurrection hymn uh, because every Sunday we can celebrate the resurrection, the first day of the week. Um, something we don't always think about, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ was not raised, he says our preaching would be useless our faith would be futile, and we'd still be in our sins. So if Christ was not raised from the dead, we would all here be under God's wrath still. And we'd have no reason for hope. I'd be a dying person speaking to dying people with absolutely no hope in this world. And yet Christ was raised, and so we can sing that uh, with joy and know that our sins are forgiven and know that we have a rock-solid faith. Let's sing then hymn 32.
This morning we have the privilege of not only hearing the gospel, but also uh, tasting the gospel in the Lord's Supper and uh, seeing it portrayed. And so to that end, we'll read uh, the part of the form that talks about self-examination, and then that goes through the Ten Commandments um, to teach us to uh, cling to Jesus Christ, to seek our, our salvation uh, in Him. So let's read that part of the form and think about this too in your own hearts as we come to the table later in faith. So we read uh, the self-examination part. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart whether he also believes the sure promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own, as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. God will certainly receive in grace all who are thus minded and count them worthy to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not feel this testimony in their heart, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to the command of Christ and of the Apostle Paul, we admonish all those who know themselves to be guilty of the following offensive sins to abstain from the table of the Lord. And we declare to them that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone or who serve him in their own manner. All who abuse the name of the Lord by cursing or in any other way. All who do not diligently attend the worship services and who despise the proclamation of God's word or the sanctity of the sacraments. All who are disobedient to their parents or to others in authority over them. All who violate human life or cherish hatred against their neighbor and refuse to be reconciled to him. All who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure. All who by stealing, greed, or extravagance lead a worldly life. All liars, backbiters, and slanderers. Briefly, all who either in word or conduct show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. While they persist in these sins, they shall not take of this food, which Christ has ordained only for his believers. Otherwise, their judgment and condemnation condemnation will be the heavier. But all this, beloved brothers and sisters, is not meant to discourage broken and contrite hearts, as if only those who are without sin may come to the table of the Lord. For we do not come to this supper to declare that we're perfect and righteous in ourselves. But on the contrary, we seek our lives outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we acknowledge that we are dead in ourselves. We are also aware of our many sins and shortcomings. We do not have perfect faith and we don't serve God with such zeal as he requires. And daily we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. Yet by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are heartily sorry for these shortcomings and desire to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God. Therefore, we may be assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can prevent us from being received by God in grace and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. Let's uh, sing together in response to uh, the self-examination and going through the commandments from Psalm 22, 1 and 5. This is a psalm that speaks about uh, the suffering of Christ and how he was poured out. And we're going to be looking at that this morning, um, how we are to pour out our lives for each other, just as Christ poured out his life even unto death for us. So let's sing Psalm 22, uh, 1 and 5.
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we know we've been called into your presence again. We know that we depend on you for everything, that our help is in your name. That you are the creator who made heavens and earth and that you made us, but you also remade us through Jesus Christ. We confess our sins. We know that we have many sins, many shortcomings, many weaknesses, that often we can gloss over our sins, certain sins that we feel are respectable, and yet we're still filled with so much uh, transgression and, and sin. And so we come before you humbly only in the name of Jesus Christ. As we sang about what he suffered for us, what he had to go through in order for us uh, to be right with you, in order for us to have unshakable hope that he had to die, he had to suffer, and then arise to new life. And as we sang and we get a window into the heart of Christ through this psalm, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you might fill our hearts with the knowledge of what Christ has done for us, the suffering he went through, that he was forsaken by you, his father. They was on the cross alone with no one to help him, rejected by heaven, rejected by earth, a curse, bearing infinite weight of sin, eternal weight of sin. And as he looked around, there was no one to comfort him. Fierce lions opening wide their mouths at him, taunting him, scorning him, mocking him. As he poured out his life like water. And so we pray that we might never, ever forget what Christ has done for us. That today as we celebrate Lord's Supper... And we might be reminded and strengthened in the faith. Reminded of what Christ has done for us. Encouraged as we commune with him through the spirit. And so we pray now that you might forgive us our sins. That we might have a renewed relationship with you. That we might then hear your word. And so open our hearts, open our minds. So that we receive your word. So that we hunger for your word as we hunger for our favorite meal. We bring all this before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's open our Bibles now to Paul's letter to the Philippians, continuing our series. (coughs) Last week we looked at uh, Philippians 2, 14 to 16, the first part of 16, how we are called to be children of God, and that we're not to... uh, do what Israel did, and we're to do what Israel failed to do. So we're not to grumble, um, but we're to uh, be children of light, holding fast to the word of life. And then this week, we'll look at Paul's next words, where he talks about uh, his life of toiling, of being poured out like a drink offering. So we'll read the context then, Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 18. Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my my beloved, as you have always obeyed, So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's sing together in response to God's word from uh, Psalm 81, Psalm 81, uh, verses 5 and 9. And verse 9, uh, pay special attention where we sing, open wide your mouth, put your trust in me. That uh, as we hear God's word, we might receive his word, we might trust his word, we might open wide our mouths, uh, hungering for his word. So Psalm 81, 5 and 9. Let's then read the words of our text and listen carefully as uh, God also feeds us through these words, gives us uh, the word of life. It's Philippians 2, we'll read starting at the uh, second part of verse 16 through to verse 18. So Paul's just talked about how they are to be uh, lights in the world. Uh, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, how are you spending your life? Think about that this morning. How are you spending your life? You know, life on this earth is very short. And the psalmist uh, speaks some very sobering words about how our lives are so short. We read, for example, Psalm 144 verse 4. We are like a breath of air. Our days are like a fleeting shadow. We're like a breath of air. Our days are like a fleeting shadow. Life goes by quickly. I'm sure many of you have heard that or have said that yourselves, that each year it seems like is a year that went by faster than the year before. Life is quick and it seems to be rushing by. And as we get older, more and more, we realize with the psalmist that our days are like a fleeting shadow. And so how are you spending your life? What are you spending your life on? Are you spending your life entirely on the pursuits of this world? On the values of this world? 
Are you investing your time and energy exclusively on, on the things of this world? Or are you investing in the treasures of the world to come? What are you spending your time on? What are you toiling on? What are you pouring yourself into? Do we see that only what's done for Christ will last? We know Paul this morning, he tells us how he's spending his life, how he has spent his life. Paul says that he's been running, that he's been toiling, that he's been poured out like a drink offering. And for what? What is he toiling? What is he laboring for? Is it so that he might have a great retirement? Is it so that he might, you know, get a better job, a better home? Why is Paul toiling so hard? Well, his life of toil, of running, of pouring himself out is a life for Christ and for his kingdom and for his people. Remember back in chapter 1 where Paul says that whether in life and death, his goal is that Christ might be exalted, that Christ might be magnified in his own life and in the life of those whom he loves, the Philippians. For Paul, Christ being, Christ being magnified was his goal. And so this morning, let's learn from Paul as he tells us that later in Philippians 3 verse 17, uh, 3 verse 17, to join in imitating him. So the theme will be uh, lives poured out. And we'll look at three things. And the first thing is uh, the life of sacrifice. So as just mentioned, Paul was a man of singular focus uh, that Christ might be magnified in him. We read in chapter 3 that he's willing to lose everything He's willing to lose his reputation. He's willing to lose everything in this world in order that he might gain Christ. That's how precious Christ was to him. And so he toiled, he labored for the cause of Christ. Because he loved Christ, he wanted Christ to be magnified and he wanted others to also join in magnifying Christ with him. And so he lived a life of sacrifice. A life we read about where he, said, he talks about running and toiling and pouring himself out. Paul talks about running. He often uh, compares the Christian life to a race where your, your eyes are on the finish line on Christ. Where you're not getting distracted by the things beside you, the things of this world, but your focus and your purpose is to live for Christ as he awaits you at that finish line. And so he's running and he wants the Philippians to join him in that race. To keep their eyes on Jesus Christ and to live for Him. Paul says he's running. He also says he's toiling. Another place in Colossians 1 verse 29, he says he toils with Christ's energy that he powerfully works in him. Paul was working. He was toiling. And he had the energy to do so because of Christ who was powerfully working in him. And Paul, he wasn't toiling for himself, but he was he was toiling, he was laboring for people like the Philippians so that they might know Christ, so that they might grow in Christ, so that he might present them when Christ returns as mature in Christ. And so Paul, he ran, he's toiling. But even more than that, we see um, the, the text, there's an escalation that not only is he running and toiling, but he also is pouring himself out as a drink offering. He says, verse 17, first part, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering. And this word, you uh, have to know, has Old Testament roots. Uh, drink offerings, maybe you aren't very familiar with them, but uh, they're mentioned in places in Exodus, uh, Numbers, and Leviticus, I think. And so um, there were certain sacrifices, uh, burnt offerings and others, that they would add drink offerings uh, to these sacrifices. So you'd have the sacrifice, an animal of some sort, and they, they would pour out, uh, usually wine, they would pour out this wine on the sacrifice. And in a way it symbolized that this drink offering was completing the sacrifice. Uh, the drink offering was a symbol of a dedication to God, that you weren't using this, this wine for yourself, but you were pouring it out before God as a sacrifice. Pouring it out to him in, in devotion and in love and in thankfulness. So you get this beautiful image uh, that Paul <coughs> is painting here uh, in verse 17. 
that he's saying here that he's being poured out upon the sacrificial offering of the Philippians' faith. So he's picturing here that the Philippians are like the sacrifice. They're like the main sacrifice. And then Paul is saying his life is like that drink offering that's poured onto their sacrifice. It's a beautiful connection, once again, you see between Paul and the Philippians that together they're presented as a a beautiful sacrifice, as we read uh, Romans 12, verse 1, holy and pleasing to God. And so you see how connected Paul is to the Philippians here, that they are living lives of sacrifice. Um, We can read about that later in, in, in Philippians 2, that they were giving Paul, out of their means, we read in uh, chapter 2, verse 30, about Epaphroditus, one of the Philippians, um, how sacrificial he was living. We read, uh, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. So here's Epaphroditus, one of the Philippians members of that church. He nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And that same word then is uh, the word in our text, that sacrificial offering. So the Philippians, they were living lives of sacrifice, devoted to God, devoted to Christ, devoted to uh, Paul as a minister of Christ. And Paul's life was then poured out on that sacrifice. And so here is Paul, a man with a life poured out. A life poured out in dedication to God. A life poured out in service to Christ and to his people. And you know, reading this sometimes as I meditated and thought about this passage, I sometimes wish that I could be more like Paul. And I'm sure we all feel that. That Paul, how he's rejoicing in prison and all these things. That he's way up here and we're all over down here. So how is Paul able to toil? How is he able to run this race? How is he able to be willing even to have his life poured out, even unto death, for the Philippians? Do you know how he was able to do this? It's because Paul never took his eyes off of Jesus. Paul never took his eyes off of Jesus. Jesus is the one we read about that he was poured out like a drink offering. You know, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, we read, it's a beautiful passage, it's called the servant song about the suffering servant, ultimately Jesus, who will come. And we read there in Isaiah 53, verse 12, that the suffering servant was one who poured out his soul to death. He poured out his soul to death. And then Jesus, he picks up this language in Matthew 26, verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 28, he's in the upper room. He's about to institute Lord's Supper. And he holds up the cup of wine and he says, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is referring to these drink offerings, the drink offerings that had wine in them. And he's saying that he will be that drink offering, that his life is going to be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And we see this literally happen In his life, in John 19, we read that the soldiers pierced his side and there came out, there poured out blood and water. Jesus' life was a drink offering, poured out. And so later, as you drink that cup of wine, as you hold that cup of wine, think about Christ and his life, his blood that was poured out for you. If you are doubting whether God loves you this morning, if you're wrestling in the assurance of that, think about that as you're drinking that wine, that Christ's life was poured out for you, that he lived every second to redeem you and to bring you to God. That every breath he took, every step he took, every time his heart was beating, he was beating as one who was poured out as a drink offering in total dedication to the Father and to redeem people like us. That his life was completely poured out so that all of our sins might be forgiven and so that everything necessary might be done that we might have fellowship with God. Christ poured out his life so that we might be saved from hell. His life was like that drink offering poured out, total dedication, obedient even unto death on a cross as we read in Philippians 2. 
so that we might have life. And so imitate him as Paul did. Not to redeem yourself, not to get yourself saved or loved by God. Because you have that in Christ. But as a sacrifice of thankfulness, pouring out your lives in service and dedication to your God. Because every second you live, you are pouring out your life on something. You know, there was a missionary pilot, you might have heard of him, called Nate Saint. And he flew four other missionaries to a remote tribe in uh, Ecuador. And when they arrived there, the five of them were killed. And many people said, what a waste. What a waste. But you know what he wrote in his journal before this? He said, people who do not know the Lord ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble has burst, he writes, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for the years they have wasted. We are all expending our lives. We are all being poured out. Either we are being poured out in dedication to God and service to him, or we are pouring ourselves out for selfish things for our own kingdoms, for our own pursuits, for treasures of this world that cannot possibly satisfy and that will not last. And so don't waste your lives. Don't pour out your lives on things that are passing away. Don't invest your life in things that in a hundred years won't be here anymore. Invest your lives in the kingdom. Because as an author once wrote, an unwasted life is one that puts Christ on display. A life that is a sweet aroma to God where Christ is our treasure, where we count all things with Paul, we count all things as a loss in order that we might gain Christ, in order that we might be found in Christ, in order that Christ might be ours and we might be his. Will you pour out your life for him? It doesn't mean we all become missionaries, but we can pour out our lives in the little things in life, in the unnoticed things, in the mundane things. Instead of getting so invested in a TV show, maybe turn it off after the third or fourth episode and pray for your service group. Pray for your church. And if you have trouble with this, the last two bulletins outlaid all different ways you can pray for your church following uh, the book, Five Things You Can Pray for Your Church. Prayers are beautiful. They have that eternal significance. They're a sweet aroma pleasing to God as we're pouring out our lives for other people. And instead of going for another uh, appointment for a sport or another round of golf, Visit someone in your ward that needs encouraging. Visit someone that needs to be built up in Christ. Instead of spending our leftovers on God, let's spend our first fruits on Him and for His work and for the kingdom of Christ. Instead of running around bringing our kids from one thing to the next, take time to teach them about Christ. Because that's a beautiful thing. As you teach them about Christ, you are doing things of eternal significance. And I speak especially to moms among us. As you nurture little ones to know Christ, and as this can be often very frustrating and a thankless job, where you feel unaccomplished maybe at the end of the day as you pour out your lives for children and they often seem ungrateful. But it's not a waste at all. It's a beautiful drink offering to Christ as you spend spend those precious moments showing them Christ, telling them about Christ, telling them about how he is your greatest treasure. You are investing in things of eternal significance. And so let's pour out our lives in service to Christ. 
The second thing then is the aim or the goal because Paul, as he toiled, as he ran the race of faith, as he poured out his life, his eyes were fixed on Christ, on the return of his master. We read in verse 16, uh, the second part of verse 16, he's doing this, he's toiling, he's laboring. He says, so that I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain uh, in the day of Christ. So in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. And now you might wonder why Paul uses the word proud, but it's not used in the way uh, we would use that word. It's used about glorying in something, about delighting in something. Paul here, he's not talking about uh, boasting in himself on the day of Christ. And he's going to say, look at what I've done, Christ. But it has nothing to do with what Paul has done, but with what Christ has done through Paul. Paul is going to glory and delight in the day of Christ as he presents his beloved Philippians before Christ. And once again, you see the love of Paul for the Philippians here that he's invested his whole life in seeing others obtain the prize. He's invested his life, he's been toiling, he's been laboring so that others might know Christ, so that others on the day of Christ might glory in Christ. You see how selfless Paul is here as he follows the example of Jesus Christ. How selfless he is that on the day of Christ, he's excited, he's going to delight as he brings those Philippians before him, as the Philippians live a life as children of God. He's been laboring his whole life in seeing others obtain the prize. And so think about this for us, especially office bearers, but for all of us. Wouldn't heaven, as one pastor put it, be like two heavens if there's just one person there as a result of Christ working through us. As a result of Christ using us as instruments in his hand. As we talked to others about Christ. As we encouraged others in Christ. As we encouraged others to grow and mature in him. What a beautiful thing on that day when we see what Christ has worked through us. And then our toil And our being poured out is not in vain. So I encourage you all to take the long view of life. To not live for the moment. To not live for instant gratification. But to live each day, each second, in full awareness of Christ's return. That you want more than anything to Christ to look on you. And in love, say well done in what I worked in you. That you delight in seeing others there as a result of Christ working in you. And so that's the aim or the goal. And then thirdly, the attitude. Because Paul says that even as his life is being poured out, even unto death, he can rejoice. And for him, Paul, uh, for him, re- rejoicing is not about having a big smile on your face. It's not about being emotionally upbeat and you know, having a happy feeling in your heart all the time. Paul could even rejoice as he toiled, as he labored, as he even wept and was full of tears. Because he could rejoice because his life was being poured out so that others might know and mature in Christ. Paul was a man who loved Christ so much that the Philippians are standing steadfast in this Christ that he can rejoice. And in verse 18, he tells them to rejoice too. He's saying there, if you don't rejoice, as I'm being poured out as a drink offering, if you're not rejoicing, you don't get it. You don't get that my greatest desire is to magnify Christ, to live for him, and to see others enter into that joy. And says Paul, even if that means that my life is being poured out as a drink offering, even unto death, then it's worth it. It's worth it. If that means you Philippians are standing steadfast in Christ. And so brothers and sisters, even in our tears, even in our pain, even in the struggles of this life, even as we cry, we can have that joy that cannot be taken away. That joy when Christ is magnified. That joy when others are joining in magnifying him. 
and to the extent or degree that Christ is our treasure, we will also have that joy of Paul. And so, brothers and sisters, I wish to uh, conclude with a poem, uh, the poem of uh, a man called C.T. Studd. This man, he was a successful college student. He was a star soccer player uh, in the 1800s from Cambridge, England. And he and some others, they committed their life uh, to go to China for mission work. And many people hounded them and said that this was a waste. They said, you're wasting a great career. You have a very promising career. You've had an excellent education. Why would you throw that all away? And he wrote a poem. Listen to it. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then that on that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Amen. Let's sing together in response, uh, hymn 43, uh, the words from Hebrews 12 of running the race of faith with our eyes fixed on Christ. now move to the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and we'll continue then reading the form of uh, about why we celebrate Lord's Supper. The form is on page uh, 603, page uh, 603 of the Book of Praise. 
So first we read about the institution of Lord's Supper. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And having uh, examined ourselves in light of God's law, let's then uh, move to the section of of, uh, remembrance of Christ. Let us now consider for what purpose the Lord has instituted his supper. Namely, that we should use it in remembrance of him. We are to remember him in the following manner. First of all, let us fully trust that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world. According to the promises made from the beginning to the fathers in the Old Testament. And that he assumed our flesh and blood. From the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth. He bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished eternally. By his perfect obedience, he has for us fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. We remember in particular that the weight of the wrath of God caused by our sins pressed out of him sweat like drops of blood falling on the ground in the garden of Gethsemane. There he was bound that we might, that he might free us from our sins. He suffered countless insults that we might never be put to shame. Though innocent, he was condemned to death that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God. He even let his blessed body be nailed to the cross that he might cancel the bond which stood against us because of our sins. By all this, he has taken our curse upon himself that he might fill us with his blessing. On the cross, he humbled himself in body and soul to the very deepest shame and anguish of hell. And then he called out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? that we might be accepted by God and never more be forsaken by him. Finally, by his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace, when he said, it is finished. In order that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his last Passover, instituted the Holy Supper. He gave the bread and the cup to his disciples in remembrance of him. He taught us to understand that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded and assured of his hearty hearty love and faithfulness towards us. It is a sure pledge that he has given his body and shed his blood for us. Otherwise, we would have suffered eternal death. He nourishes and refreshes our hungry and thirsty souls with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life. As certainly as this bread is broken before our eyes and this cup is given to us, And we eat and drink in remembrance of him. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross. It is the only ground for our salvation. Thereby he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has removed the cause of our eternal hunger and misery, which is sin, and obtained for us the life-giving spirit. By the Spirit who dwells in Christ as the head and in us as his members, we have true communion with him and share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness, and glory. By the same Spirit, we are also united in true brotherly love as members of one body. For the Apostle Paul says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. As one bread is baked out of many grains and one wine is pressed out of many grapes, So we all, incorporated in Christ by faith, are together one body. For the sake of Christ, who so exceedingly loved us first, we shall now love one another and shall show this to one another, not just in words, but also in deeds. 
Finally, Christ has commanded us to celebrate this holy supper until he comes. We receive at his table a foretaste of the abundant joy which he has promised and look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb where he will drink uh, the wine new with us in the kingdom of his Father. Let us rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming. May the almighty heavenly God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive all this, let us now humble ourselves before God in prayer and call upon him in true faith. And at the end of the prayer, we will pray the Lord's Prayer, and I invite you to join me in reciting uh, the Lord's Prayer. (coughs) Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in this supper we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we may entrust ourselves more and more to your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our contrite hearts may be nourished with his true body and blood. Yes, with him who is the only heavenly bread, that we may not live in our sins, but Christ in us and we in him. Let us so truly be partakers of this new and everlasting testament, the covenant of grace, that we don't doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father nevermore imputing to us our sins, but providing us with all things for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may take up our cross joyfully, deny ourselves and confess our Savior. Let us in all tribulation await our Lord Jesus Christ, who will come from heaven to change our mortal body to be like his glorious body and take us to himself forever. Hear us through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now together profess our Catholic undoubted Christian faith, and we'll do this with reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed. We'll do that uh, standing. Please join me then in reciting our, our faith in our God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in order that we may now be nourished with Christ, uh, our true heavenly bread, we must not cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but lift up our hearts on high in heaven, where Christ, our advocate, is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit, as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. I now ask the elders to come forward and distribute the bread, and you are reminded that the bread is uh, gluten-free. I'll 
at Glucose 3. The bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
Now ask that the elders come forward and distribute the wine. In the, in the middle of each tray, there's uh, grape juice. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is a communion of the blood of Christ 
Take, drink from it, all of you. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let's now stand together and we'll sing uh, hymn 30. Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord has now nourished our souls at his table, let us together praise his holy name. Let everyone say in his heart, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with, with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Therefore, my heart and my mouth shall proclaim the praise of the Lord from now on and forevermore. Amen. In our prayer, congregational prayer this morning, we will uh, pray for Grace Van Andel, who had uh, knee surgery this week uh, that went well. We'll also pray for Ralph Freebold, who had foot surgery this week. Um, that his uh, surgery also uh, went well. We'll pray for Ben Harsevort, who was hospitalized uh, this week and who is recovering. Um, we'll also pray for Brooke Ludwig, who has a cerebral uh, angiogram scheduled for this Friday uh, as a follow-up. And we'll pray for Minnie Meyer, who has been experiencing additional pain 
I went for a test uh, this week and waits, is waiting for results. And lastly, we'll, we'll also pray for the uh, Khalid, Khalid family, uh, Sivan Ban, and the rest of the family. Uh, they've been on the overhead a few times in the past week. Um, the uh, family that we hope uh, will come here in due time. And they passed their interviews, and so now they can take the next step in coming to us, uh, the Lord willing, in due time. Uh, let's pray together. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that you and your uh, boundless mercy have given us your only begotten Son, our mediator. We praise you that he is the sacrifice for our sins and our food and drink to life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith through which we may share in your in such great benefits. Through your Son, you have instituted the supper for the strengthening of our faith. We earnestly ask you, faithful God and Father, that by your Holy Spirit, this celebration may lead to our daily increase in true faith and fellowship with Christ, your beloved Son. We also, Father, bring before you at this time the needs of our congregation. We pray that you be with uh, those who have had surgeries this past week. We pray that they might continue to recover. Be with Grace Van Andel, with Ralph uh, Freebold, that you watch over them, that you give them what they need, and that they might uh, be reassured and confirmed in your love uh, for them. We pray that you be with our brother Ben Harsevoort as he's in the hospital, and we pray that he might come home in due time, and that you might recover, and that you might give him your strength and energy in this time. We ask that you be with Brooke Ludwig as she awaits, uh, the Lord willing, a um, angiogram this coming uh, Friday. We pray that you give her what she needs as she awaits the patience and the strength. We also that you be with Minnie Meyer as she awaits uh, the results of tests. We pray that you give her uh, relief from pain and that you might uh, also continue to show your, your grace, and your goodness in her life. We pray that you be with others who are leaving. We think of Dave and Michelle Van Assen. We pray that you give them uh, what they need as they take up uh, their uh, place in a new family in Living Waters URC. We pray that you give them strength there, that, you, um, that they might be a blessing there also, and that they might uh, have encouragement and strength from you and be part of the fellowship there. We pray that you be with uh, also, those who are traveling, many of us who are traveling right now, going on uh, vacations or other things, we ask that you be in particular for uh, our sister, Mark Stam, as she travels to the Netherlands for the next uh, three months, that you give her a good time there, uh, a time of visiting, and a time um, where you continue to show your, your grace to her. We ask that you be with uh, those who are, Lord willing, coming here in due time. We think of the Khalid family. We thank you that they could pass their interviews um, in this past week, and we pray that you continue to be with them as they go through uh, the next part of um, the, the procedure to come here. We pray that you might bless that, and they might come here in due time. We pray that um, you might lift them up through our prayers as well and strengthen them as well as they deal with uh, hard times there. We ask that you watch over us all um, as we... Uh, go from here that you might nourish us indeed in the faith that we might hunger for Christ more, that we might seek to pour out our lives for him, not to earn anything, but as a sacrifice of thankfulness. We ask that you bring us here again this afternoon and be with uh, the pastor uh, Peter Feenstra this afternoon, that you watch over him and give him strength to bring us your word. We bring all this before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, have an opportunity to show your thankfulness as offering also of sacrifice to God um, from your gifts. After the offering, we will sing the hymn, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me.
Dear brothers and sisters, receive God's blessing and go with his peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.